When most of us hear the word hostage, we think of someone held captive by a terrorist group or criminal gang seeking ransom, attention, or worse. But as we first reported in February, the vast majority of Americans imprisoned abroad today are not held by terrorist groups, but by foreign governments with whom the U.S. has thorny or, in some cases, no relations. Our government calls them wrongful detainees, and there are currently more than 40 of them. Last fall saw a rare moment of success, the release of then 37-year-old journalist Danny Fenster, a Detroit native who'd been locked away for nearly six months in a small, always-lit cell in a prison in Myanmar, formerly called Burma. The story will continue in a moment. Danny Fenster's reunion with his family in November Thank you for everything. is the moment every hostage and detainee family dreams of. How's it feel to be back? It feels incredible. Danny Fenster had moved to Myanmar in 2019 and worked as an editor for several publications. He and his wife, a Brazilian diplomat named Juliana, watched in dismay <laughs> as a year ago February, a military junta ousted the elected government of Aung San Suu Kyi, which brought throngs of peaceful protesters into the streets. Within weeks, though, the military regime ordered a violent crackdown that drew worldwide condemnation. Late last spring, Danny had a flight home to visit his parents. But as he was about to board the plane, a group of policemen showed up and called out his name. And I just looked up like, what? Uh, and I said, yeah, that's me. And they said, we uh, have questions for a criminal investigation. Did they allow you to make any phone calls? No. No, I got a couple text messages off to Juliana saying, call the American embassy. I had been being detained. Were you handcuffed? Handcuffed and blindfolded. I had a very long text message from his wife, Juliana. Brian Fenster, Danny's older brother, back home in Detroit, was the first in the family to learn that Danny was in prison, and the family immediately mobilized. Please, I beg you, we beg you, bring Danny home. They launched a Bring Danny Home campaign, including supporters worldwide sketching his picture. Danny was eventually charged with incitement and wrongful association based on his work for a banned publication that had been critical of the military, even though he hadn't worked there for 10 months. He says he desperately wanted to let his family know he wasn't being tortured, but for weeks he wasn't allowed any communication at all outside the prison. I remember just staring at the wall thinking, sort of figuratively, you know, I just, when is that tank going to bust through the wall, you know, and get me out of here? You really thought at one point you were going to be rescued? No, but I was really hoping. Release Danny immediately. The State we Department so. made repeated appeals. We remain deeply concerned over the continued detention of, of Danny Fenster. But the U.S. government hasn't recognized the legitimacy of the junta. So even getting information about Danny was difficult. After a month, he was finally allowed periodic phone calls with his family. It was hard. I mean, there were many calls we had with him where he was in tears. You're trying to find the words for him. You know, after one month, two months, three months, four months. Back in Washington, Danny's case had fallen under the mandate of Roger Carstens, one of the few State Department officials held over from the Trump administration. He's a man with a tough job and an odd-sounding title. You're called Spiha. What does that mean, Spiha? It's Special Presidential Envoy for Hostage Affairs. So everyone truncates it into Spiha. The Spiha office was created in 2015 after an internal review of U.S. hostage policy following the tragic deaths of American journalists and aid workers held captive by ISIS and complaints from hostage families that the government hadn't been proactive enough. But in the years since, the makeup of Roger Carston's cases has changed. I'm kind of surprised that there are many more, many more hostages being held by governments than by terrorists. 
I know that is surprising, isn't it? Uh, the, the majority of our cases are actually what we call wrongful detentions. It's when a nation state actually is detaining American essentially unjustly. That government wants something in return for our citizens. They want to use that person for political leverage. They want to use them as a bargaining chip. It's something that people don't know about. They don't uh, think about very much. Washington Post reporter and Iranian-American Jason Rezaian was a wrongful detainee himself, imprisoned for a year and a half in Iran, where he'd been living as the paper's bureau chief. He was freed as part of a prisoner swap in 2016 and has been pushing ever since for the U.S. government to prioritize the cases of the more than 40 current wrongful detainees. We're not doing enough for these people, and we're not doing it quickly enough. What countries around the world are holding Americans right now? Iran, which is sort of the perennial hostage taker. China, who has more than anybody else. Russia, Venezuela. Does our government have a stern policy against quid pro quos? That's a hard question to answer, and here's why. There are things that to give in would actually either provide an incentive or a benefit to the hostage taker. And so my job is to start becoming creative. What else can we possibly do to solve this problem without giving a direct concession? Prisoner swaps, mm -hmm. taking the innocent American and swapping him for a guilty criminal. We've done that. If there's a way I can get someone out uh, that doesn't involve a swap, much better. But in Danny Fenster's case, the Myanmar government wasn't asking for any policy concessions or prisoner swaps. It didn't look like he was going to get out. Enter former congressman, U.N. ambassador, and New Mexico governor Bill Richardson, who established a foundation that facilitates the delivery of humanitarian aid and engages in hostage negotiating, his longtime, sometimes controversial specialty. How are you feeling? He had a long history with Myanmar and was concerned about a local former employee of his foundation who had also been arrested. He secured an invitation from the military regime to come to discuss humanitarian assistance and COVID vaccines and told the State Department he wanted to work on the Fenster case too, but he got pushback. They asked me not to raise Danny Fenster. Did you say, why shouldn't I raise it? Yeah, I said, look, this is what I do. What? So I said, all right, look, I'm going to go. There was some tension between Governor Richardson and the State Department. The bottom line is that I had discussions on a few occasions where I said, we have a current line of effort. Uh, I'm feeling pretty good about this. Can we hold off a little bit? Richardson held off briefly, but then flew to Myanmar this past November and participated in two days of humanitarian aid meetings at the presidential palace with the isolated military regime, including the commander in chief, a man considered responsible at the time for more than 1,200 civilian deaths. It was a PR coup for the junta, which splashed photos of the meeting far and wide. When I think we convinced them of our sincerity, then I said, by the way, you've got, I want two things. You have an activist Burmese woman that worked for me. I want you to release her. The next day, she'd been released. Just like that? Just like that. Then I decided, I'm on a roll. <laughs> By the way, there's an American journalist named Danny Fenster, and you should release it. It'd be the right thing. The American people are going to like this. Your record with the U.S. government right now is not very good. <laughs> so it, it'd make you look good. Humanitarian gesture. But you were defying the State Department. I wasn't defying. I just saw an opportunity, and I took it. Richardson says the commander privately told him he'd release Fenster, but not yet. So he left Myanmar empty-handed, slammed for having given a pariah regime legitimacy, and looking like he might have made things worse for Danny Fenster, who was sentenced a week later. You've been convicted on every count and sentenced to 11 years. 11 years? Yeah. It was like uh, despair, you know? Yeah. Um, helpless. Yeah, helpless. There was criticism. There was feeling that you had botched this meeting and it led to Danny Fenster 
getting this 11-year sentence? You know, families get so emotional that they go through ups and downs. But I knew if the commander kept his word, and I thought he would, that this would be forgotten. Go away, yeah. And I got him out. He's out. And we did it. Sure enough, just days after the sentencing, Richardson was quietly summoned back to Myanmar, and Danny was unexpectedly taken out of his cell, put in a van, and without knowing where he was going, driven to the airport. And I just see a bunch of white guys in suits. I didn't know who was who. And there was Danny uh, walking towards me. And he said, I'm here to take you home. I just couldn't stop smiling. I was smiling so much, I was so happy. The sun was on my face, I could feel the sun. Yeah, it was amazing. I'd like to start with saying thank you to Governor Richardson for securing the release of Danny Fenster. If there was any lingering anger over Governor Richardson's trip, it was not on display at the press conference when Danny landed on U.S. soil. I just can't get upset when the governor actually brings him home. We have no pride of authorship. Whoever can come up with a plan and get someone out, we're down for the win. Karsten says he's hopeful about some of the other detainee cases. He traveled to Venezuela in December to meet nine Americans in prison there. And during negotiations to revive the Iran nuclear deal, the U.S. envoy said it would be very hard for us to imagine getting back into the nuclear deal while four innocent Americans are being held hostage. Yet Jason Rezaian says it's still not enough. When you say we should prioritize getting these people out, yep. The implication is that you're saying, let's make a deal, let's do a swap, and then you're right back to the issue of incentivizing this thing. Look, ultimately, when Americans come home, when Brits come home, when French people come home, there are some concessions. The issue is not whether or not to give a concession. The issue is, how do we make it difficult on the back end? So you're saying, make the deal here and then punish them later. Bring them home however you need to do it. Money, and then, hot swaps, whatever. You know what? Cut through all the BS and just bring people home. Critics say mm -hmm. that even though you work very hard, you keep the families apprised of what's going on, that you're not doing a good job. There are still 40 people being held. When I go to bed every night, I feel the weight of not having brought home between 40 and 50 Americans. So I don't go to bed. Uh, usually feeling good. I usually wake up with energy. Can't wait to get to the office and get back after it. But this is a business of ones and zeros in computer language. Someone comes home, steps on a tarmac in America, falls into the arms of their loved ones. You've, you've got a victory there. But unless that's happening, you're losing. Hello. We want to leave you. with a pretty special falling into the arms of a loved one. Oh, my God! Danny's reunion with his 95-year-old grandmother, a survivor of the Holocaust. But I'm happy in America. Yeah. God bless you. Since our story first aired, three wrongful detainees were released, two by the Venezuelan government and one Trevor Reed by Russia. But WNBA star Brittany Griner was arrested in Russia in February, accused of having hashish oil in her luggage. Last month, the State Department deemed her a wrongful detainee, and she remains in custody.